Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us to get the most updated information about our pandemic response here in the state of Illinois. Let me begin by reminding everyone of the unfortunate truth. COVID-19 has not gone away, and it remains a serious threat. You watch your online news feeds or TV without seeing reports of record cases and deaths across the United States, then you're missing something because we see it in places like Florida and Texas, California, Arizona, and Alabama, and other places. And we're seeing positivity rates rising and at new heights in our neighboring states of Iowa and Indiana, Missouri, Kentucky, and Wisconsin. Illinois' carefully, careful reopening and conscientious people who are mask-wearing, social distancing residents of our state have kept our positivity rates at around half of our nearest neighbors, one-sixth of Florida's and one-fifth of Texas. But let's not forget that it doesn't take long at all to reverse all of our gains and for a trajectory of success to be turned on its head. COVID-19 knows no boundaries, and the United States is one indivisible nation. If there had been one national strategy employed by our federal government, like a national mask mandate, perhaps things would be different. But that hasn't happened, and we can't rely on that possibility. In the meantime, Illinois has set policies for itself, and we've seen real progress over these last four and a half months, but our numbers now appear to be gradually rising, and that's very concerning. Today, we're reporting nearly 1,600 new confirmed cases of COVID-19, our highest in the month of July. I will remind everyone that we look at these numbers via seven-day rolling averages and not one-day totals, but a rise is still a rise, and it is on all of us to bring these numbers down. There are those who mistakenly think, no problem, you can't eradicate the virus, and our numbers are so low, we don't need to do anything about it. To them, I would say that in every one of the states like Arizona and Florida, that are in full-blown crisis right now. It started with a gradual rise in the numbers. The best doctors in our state, who are some of the best in the nation and the world, tell me that a gradually rising positivity rate is exactly when the exponential factors can take over. You can go from 3% positivity to Arizona's 23% positivity in the blink of an eye. We've been there. Let's not let that happen again. And let me also say to virus deniers, this virus is not a blue state virus and it's not a red state virus. The deadly nature of this virus is not a hoax. Choosing to go out in public without a mask is not a political statement. Going out without a face covering on endangers the other customers at the grocery store. It puts your friends and your family at risk. There's nothing political about that. It demonstrates a callous disregard for the people in your community and in your county and in our state and our nation. The enemy is not your mask. If you're not wearing a mask in public, you're endangering everyone around you. So the enemy is you. Yesterday in the Metro East region, I sounded the alarm on the region's 7.1% rolling seven-day average positivity rate compared to the state's overall 3.1%. Outside of Metro East, the rest of our 11 regions all fall below 5%, ranging from 2.2% in Region 6, Eastern Illinois, to 4.9% in Region 7, Kankakee and Will Counties. As IDPH Director Dr. Azike and I announced last week, the state will take immediate action to impose additional mitigations if a region crosses over the metrics that we set. And Metro East is coming dangerously close to that. 
So I have spoken with local leaders and I've asked them to clamp down on the outbreaks where they are occurring so that the state won't have to step in. We're now testing record numbers of Illinoisans and we've brought our overall positivity rates down to low single digits statewide from a high of 23% in early spring. If that number pushes back up past 8% in any region, that's a problem of local businesses and residents not following mitigation strategies. Contrary to what the president says, more testing does not cause rising positivity rates. With local information about outbreaks readily available to the public on the IDPH website and on local public health department websites, we're counting on city and county leaders doing what they know is right to protect their residents. And we're counting on local residents to hold their elected leaders accountable. Demand that they take action early so that regions don't have to undergo the challenges of staying at home or closing local businesses again. If it sounds like I'm taking this extremely seriously, it's because I am, and you should too. It's imperative that we hold on to the success that we've had against this virus. We've made tremendous progress since we launched this battle just a few months ago. To begin with, Illinois has built one of the largest testing programs in the nation. Since our last update just a week ago, Illinois has set a new record, surpassing 40,000 tests in three of the last seven days. Volume at our drive through sites is up 53% since July 6th, and we are expanding to more lanes at high volume sites and bringing on larger lab capacity to ensure results are returned as fast as possible. We have over 280 testing sites around the state, including over 100 federally qualified health centers that will serve anyone, regardless of insurance status. Find the site nearest you at dph.illinois.gov slash testing. Critical to maximizing the efficacy of testing is contact tracing. We now have over 1,600 contact tracers who interview trace, and provide follow-up for close contacts of cases in their respective jurisdictions. 57 of our local health departments, about 60% of them, have been granted $50 million in contact tracing grants, and there's more to come. Hiring continues, and anyone interested should connect with their local public health department if they want to become a contact tracer. And today, I'm proud to announce that beginning Friday, community-based organizations can apply for funding to do contact tracing in collaboration with local health departments. The COVID-19 Pandemic Health Navigator Program is geared toward organizations able to serve as coordinators for their region, sub-awarding to other agencies across three main areas of work, education and outreach, contact tracing, and resource coordination for those who need to isolate. Because Chicago and its immediate suburbs are running their own community programs, these grants are focused on regional leaders outside of Cook County. Of course, most important to our ability to minimize outbreaks is the efforts of everyday people to do their part. If one of our statewide force of 1,600 contact tracers calls you, please answer. And there's more that you can do by reminding your neighbors, your friends, your family to wear a mask when they're in public. Stay away from large gatherings. Maintain physical distance. Wash your hands. Test regularly and continue looking out for your fellow Illinoisans. I have every faith in our ability to get through this and come out stronger on the other side. Before I hand over the podium, I want to address a few additional issues related to our COVID-19 response. First, unemployment. Across the nation, state unemployment systems have been overwhelmed by the unprecedented need brought on by this pandemic and Americans in every state have paid the price. Here in Illinois, we're taking every measure to expand our processing systems and expedite benefits. And while that work is ongoing every day that a resident's earned and deserved benefits are delayed, 
is one day too many. Unfortunately, that's just the tip of the iceberg with our national unemployment framework. This morning, the Illinois Department of Employment Security announced that we've uncovered and are investigating a nationwide fraud scheme impacting each state's federal pandemic unemployment assistance program. The department is working alongside federal law enforcement to investigate, pursue, and prosecute those who are involved in these illegal schemes, which are occurring in nearly every state. I want to ask members of the media to help spread the word that an individual who has not filed an unemployment claim but has received a debit card or an unemployment insurance letter in the mail has likely been a target of this fraud. Federal authorities have informed states that your personal identifying information may likely have been obtained in prior breaches of corporate or other databases like the massive Equifax breach. That means it's possible that your personal identifying information was used in this scheme. If you received a letter from IDES or a debit card but did not apply for unemployment, please contact IDES at 800-814-0513. If you received a debit card in the mail, do not activate it. It's also highly recommended that you check your credit report for possible suspicious activity. Again, this is a problem being experienced all across the country right now because the national program was poorly designed and susceptible to fraud. But I can promise Illinoisans that our state government and law enforcement authorities will do everything in our power to support anyone who's been affected by this system-wide failure. I also want to provide an update for our residents who are at risk of losing their housing because of this pandemic. Since March, we've protected millions of Illinoisans by banning residential evictions. Today, I'm extending that moratorium through August 22nd. I take this step today because I want to ensure that we have support in places, in place, sorry, that we have support in place for those who are most vulnerable. As many of you know, we worked with the General Assembly to put in place two programs to help those whose housing is insecure, one for renters and one for homeowners, each distributing $150 million. Starting the week of August 10th, applications will open for renters and then the week of August 28th for homeowners. Through the fall, recipients will be awarded grants of $5,000 for renters and up to $15,000 for homeowners. And meanwhile, we continue to explore partnerships and ways that we can provide additional support. For many people, their ability to weather this crisis hinges on their ability to keep a roof over their families' heads. It's not enough to say that we want to build a more just and equitable state on the other side of this pandemic. We have to take tangible action to get there. Today marks another step forward, though, frankly, our work is not done. So thank you, and now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ngazi Azike for today's medical update. Doctor. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon to everyone. I'll begin today with an update on COVID-19-related metrics for cases, death, and hospitalizations. So since yesterday, we are reporting 1,598 people who were newly diagnosed with COVID-19 for a total of 165,301 cases. Sadly, we must also report 23 additional deaths for a total of 7,347 Illinoisans who have lost their lives to COVID. As of last night, 1,456 people were in hospitals across Illinois uh, with COVID, and of those, 337 patients were in the ICU, and 132 patients were on ventilators. Testing capacity across the state continues to grow. To date, over 2.3 million tests have been run, with 39,633 being resulted in just the last 24 hours. Thank you for, to the people of Illinois for knowing that testing and knowing 
Your status for that day is important and showing up to these testing sites. We have made tremendous strides, but as we anticipated, as more places open up and people gather in larger and larger groups, we are seeing an increase in new COVID-19 cases. You probably have seen people crowding into bars, areas where people were not wearing masks or not maintaining six feet of distance between one another. Maybe you've seen establishments hosting large events or large summer street parties. You may ask, why do we keep talking about face coverings and distancing? Because these are simple measures that will, in fact, help protect us and all the people around us. So I don't understand when trying to protect our neighbors became a bad act. I, I venture to guess that nobody is disappointed about all the lives saved and all the cancers that were prevented from keeping restaurants and bars free of dangerous secondhand smoke. I think we are proud to protect our, our waiters and our waitresses and our hostesses and our bartenders. I see this as a similar measure. Or look at it another way. Think of when you're driving an automobile. No one hopes to be in an accident. We wear seatbelts to protect us in the event that there is a crash. Seatbelts are used universally to save people and vehicles from harm or death. And we have a chance to do the same thing with masking and distancing. So what's the controversy? Not wearing face coverings, not social distancing, is what will take us back to the era that we were just a few short months ago, where we were reporting hundreds of deaths every single day. Each community is different, and what works in Rockford may not work in Taylorville. What works in East St. Louis may not work in Chicago, but there are certain things that are universal, and that's simple masking, face coverings, distancing, and washing our hands. Those are basic and universal. After those three Ws of uh, watching your distance, washing your hands, and wearing a face covering, the rest is not so formulaic. And so we're going to work region by region, community by community, to figure out what additional steps are needed. But the more people dismiss the science that says social distancing and face coverings work, the more cases we'll see. The more cases we'll see, the more dangerous it will be for people as they're trying to go back to school. It's up to every individual, each business, every community, to uphold these very simple strategies to do what's right. Please wear a face covering if you're going out to dinner. Businesses, please require customers to keep six feet of distance between each other. Please require the use of face covering. Communities should take aggressive action when they see an increase in cases. That might be reducing the number of people that are allowed. There may be certain businesses that have to be suspended. Communities know best what activities and what behaviors are, that they are seeing that are resulting in the additional COVID cases. And we are trusting on the communities to help us identify the best ways to stop the continued spread. This is not about restricting freedom. This is about decreasing the transmission of this virus, which ultimately saves lives. It's that plain. It's that simple. This is about your actions and what you can do to keep you and your community safe. As the governor said, please let us not reverse all the gains that we have made. We actually do know things that will slow the spread of this virus. Think of your face covering as your seatbelt and treat it as such. Let's please watch our distance, wear our face coverings, and wash our hands. Thank you so much. And now uh, a summary of the uh, comments in Spanish. Buenas tardes a todos. Comienzo hoy con el reporte sobre las métricas relacionadas con COVID-19 para casos, muertes, y hospitalizaciones en, la, en el estado. Desde ayer, estamos, reportan, estamos reportando 1,598 personas recién diagnosticadas con COVID-19. En total, son más de 165,000 casos. Desafortunadamente, eso incluye 23 muertes adicionales reportadas para un total de más de 
7,300 vidas perdidas. Desde anoche nos informamos 1,456 personas en Illinois fueron hospitalizadas con COVID-19. De ellos, 337 pacientes estaban en la unidad de cuidados intensivos y 132 pacientes estaban en ventiladores. La capacidad de pruebas en todo el estado sigue creciendo. Más de 39 mil pruebas hechas en las últimas 24 horas. Hemos avanzado mucho, pero como anticipamos, cuando se abren más lugares y la gente se junta en grupos, vemos un aumento en los nuevos casos de COVID-19. Es posible que hayas visto a muchas personas en lugares sociales sin usar máscaras o mantener una distancia de seis pies entre ellos. Tal vez se pregunta, ¿por qué hay tanto enfoque en las cubrecaras y el distanciamiento físico? ¿Por qué estas son las cosas simples que ayudarán a proteger a usted y a las personas que están cerca? Nadie está enojado por todas las vidas salvadas de mantener los restaurantes y bares libres del humo de cigarrillos. O para verlo de otra manera, los conductores nunca esperan tener un accidente. Usamos cinturones de seguridad para protegernos en caso de un choque. Los cinturones de seguridad se deben usar universalmente para salvar a las personas en vehículos de daños o muerte. Tenemos la misma oportunidad de hacer eso con los cubrecaras y el distanciamiento físico. ¿Cuál es la controversia? Estas acciones son las que nos regresan a los miles de casos nuevos que reportamos cada día en mayo. Cada comunidad es diferente y lo que funciona Funciona en Rockford, puede no funcionar en Taylorville. No hay una talla solo para todos, aparte de usando desmáscaras y distanciamiento. Si la gente sigue sin creer en la ciencia y dicen que el, el distanciamiento social y los cubrecaras fun no funcionan, vamos a ver más casos. Necesitamos que cada individuo cada negocio y cada comunidad defiende la ciencia y seguir nuestros consejos. Los negocios deben pedir a los clientes que mantengan seis piezas de distancia y que se cubren la cara. Y las comunidades deben tomar medidas agresivas cuando vean un aumento en los casos. Eso puede incluir cerrar negocios temporalmente o reducir la cantidad de personas permitidas adentro. Escúchame, por favor, esto no se trata de un gran gobierno o de quitar la libertad. Se trata de salvar vidas, plano y simple, nada más. Realmente se trata de sus acciones y de lo que haces para mantener seguro a usted y a su comunidad. No hay que pedir todas las ganancias que hemos logrado. Sabemos lo que se necesita para frenar la propagación. Cuiden su distancia. Pónganse un cubre cara. Lávense las manos. Muchísimas gracias por su apoyo. And with that, I will turn it over to Governor Pritzker. Thank you, Dr. Zike. And uh, before I take questions, I also want to take a moment to address the violence that too many residents are experiencing in their communities. As governor, I have and will continue to invest in communities that have been neglected for far too long. Earlier today, I also spoke to the head of the Chicago office of the FBI to convey my longstanding position. I welcome legitimate resources from the federal government to reduce violence and help our residents stay safe. That can mean getting illegal guns off the street or investigating criminal enterprises. And I welcome the support for our local and state efforts to reduce crime. But let's be clear, that also means we must invest in our schools, in our physical and mental health services, in workforce development programs that build up opportunity where years of disinvestment have hollowed it out. If you want to fix a problem, you start with the roots of the problem. 
But what I will not stand for are efforts that undermine civil rights and civil liberties like what's happening in Portland, conducted anonymously under the cover of darkness and with no transparency. Any effort from the federal government to undermine the basic freedoms this nation has in its best moments aspired to protect will be met with resistance from this state government. Thank you, and now I'd be happy to take questions from members of the media. Well, let's start with that since that's what you've been talking. I uh, know that yesterday I read that you spoke to the Homeland Security. What, what's your response then? Might we see federal agents without insignias on the streets of Chicago? The acting director, acting secretary of Homeland Security did not return my phone call and said that he would not over the next 48 hours. So that's what happened in that call yesterday. I have worked um, tirelessly over the last few days uh, speaking with not only the mayor but the attorney general to coordinate activities that we might engage in if we need to push back on some uh, force of the federal protective services that might arrive, the kinds of forces that are on the ground in Portland. Um, and so we're, you know, we're talking about that, working that out. Um, we are hopeful that that will not be the case. We know that the ATF, the FBI, the DEA uh, are coming to and are in Chicago uh, engaged in activities to help our local law enforcement. The state police are engaged in that. Chicago police departments, police departments across the state, in fact, are engaged in that. And that, that seems legitimate activity to uh, go after criminal enterprises. And I encourage that. We need to get violence and criminal enterprises shut down. Um, but it's this other thing that's going on where people are wearing camouflaged uniforms with no identification about who they are, claiming to be protecting federal buildings when in fact they're going blocks and blocks away from federal buildings to do things like throw people into vans and arrest them without telling them why they're being arrested uh, and then keeping them for hours before letting them go. Uh, that is not something that is acceptable in the state of Illinois or the city of Chicago. Governor, how close are you to the Republican Senate Chairman in Illinois? Have you been talking with Bob Clinton on that? Are you looking at another bigger tool, rather than Denver, like Biden to pull the trigger? Well, we're not going to be arbitrary about this. We put a plan out there just last week um, to show what we would do. It would be on a regional basis. Um, and if in any region, and I specifically called out the region that includes Metro East, uh, St. Clair County, Madison County, Randolph County, and so on. Uh, there is a significant rise there, or at least they have, frankly, they have had this uh, increased case number uh, and positivity rate for some time now. This has been going on. Uh, part of that is because the, the positivity rates in Missouri are so much higher than they are in Illinois, and people who live in that area often cross the bridge, go into St. Louis and other places in Missouri. Um, and so we are working with the uh, local authorities there, the local elected officials, uh, to have them go in and impose mitigations locally uh, because, you know, regions include a number of counties. Uh, we don't want any one single county to drive a whole region, for example. In this case, it's several of the counties within that region. Uh, so we're going to continue to work with them. There are lots of mitigations that we put forward last week that include things like reducing or eliminating capacity indoors in bars across the state. Uh, it includes things like, you know, questions about adult and youth sports leagues that are ongoing this summer and, you know, what we've seen and whether we need to uh, cut back on that. There are lots of uh, listed items there that you can look at to see what it is, what the menu of items are that we're looking at. And it'll be slightly different in each county, and I think the doctor said that as well. So I hear you saying it's kind of raising the alarm here about the increase in cases while we're still Yes. When you look at Wisconsin and you look at Indianapolis and you look at Missouri, that we are increasingly surrounded by states that are, have sharp increases. Why not have a considerable statewide strategy? And I, I hear what you're saying about regional counties, mm -hmm. but if our states are a location where we've made some progress, is there a way of protecting the state? So let me begin by, by doubling down on what you just said, which is every state around us has either double or triple our positivity rate. So this is challenging for us, right? And we don't live in a country where you close the borders between states. And we're not going to stop people who live in Illinois and work in Wisconsin from doing so. 
and you can't ask somebody who crosses the border every day to go to work, who's following all the mitigations that we've asked, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands, all the things that we've asked them to do. They're not gathering in large groups, but they go to work every day. You can't ask them to quarantine for 14 days um, at a time. So that's not something that we really can do. We, 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 you know, we have a lot of border counties in Illinois uh, where people on one side or the other of the border regularly cross because they have family uh, or because they uh, work on the other side of the border. So instead, what we need is for Illinoisans to do, frankly, what most people have been doing, but we just need everybody to pay close, close attention to this. If you're not wearing a mask, you're doing it wrong. You have to wear a mask. If I told you you could take a pill that would reduce the likelihood of you getting COVID-19 by 80%, wouldn't you do it? It's safe? You would do it. And that's what happens when people wear masks. We reduce the likelihood of transmission by 80%. Let's just do that. We are going to get to the end of this. It appears there's progress around vaccines and treatments. And, you know, it may take months, though. And in those in intervening months, we don't want people to get sick and die. And we want to make sure we keep Illinoisans safe. People can do it for themselves. And we're encouraging local officials to shut down things, for example, like we're aware of a party bus company uh, in Metro East where people get on and they go from bar to bar to bar. Well, guess what happened? Somebody on one of those party buses uh, either contracted it along the way or had it when they uh, went on a party bus and spread it uh, to the locations that they went to. So the local officials have to be asking themselves, how do we cut down on the spread? Well, one way to do that might be to, first of all, completely disinfect all the buses. Second of all, uh, make sure you've got social distancing. And third, possibly shutting down those party buses. You talked about contact tracers. Yes. So far, you've got 1,600. We do. Is the state hiring more, or will they hire through locally? And is the contact tracing giving you lots of info? It is. So thank you for asking, because we're proud of the work that's being done by the contact tracing effort. Um, it is being done at the county level or at the local public health department level, uh, including in the city of Chicago, including in Rockford and so on. What we're doing is providing guidelines and grants for each of those 97, I know we have 102 counties, but we have 97 local public health departments and each of those responsible for their local area it has applied for these grants. As I said today, 57 of them have been granted so far, uh, dollar, $50 million so far, to hire people locally. And they've been doing it, frankly, for some time anyway. They understand they need more contact tracers locally and that money's on the way. Um, many of those county public health departments are also taking people from other positions within their county public health department and moving them to contact tracing in order to beef up their ability. Progress has been good. Um, of the cases of the contacts that are identified, uh, they're so far reaching about 61% of those within a reasonable period of time. Um, we've got a lot more work to do because we have people who are contacts who are not offering, or, sorry, who are cases, who are not offering all of their contacts or uh, have made themselves unreachable uh, while they are recovering. And that's a challenge for us. We need people to volunteer information to help us keep other people safe. So we're working on that, and uh, we continue to build up the contact tracing uh, people. Remember, they're not just doing contacts, not just phone calls to people. There's also follow-up. When somebody is contacted and you're told, contacted and you're told that uh, you have come in contact with somebody who's uh, tested positive, you're asked to quarantine. Well, somebody who is elderly, for example, and needs to be able to they, they live on their own, they need to be able to go to the grocery store, they need to go to the pharmacy, whatever, you don't want them leaving their home while they're quarantined. And so we're offering services. We have people who connect with them every day, sometimes just online, sometimes uh, by phone, to check in, can we provide you services, and then connecting with local services in that area to make sure that someone will deliver a meal, for example.
clearly it's not a question anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So we have seen an increase in cases, and um, I know people. You know, some people say, oh, it's just because there's more testing. There's a way to look at that. Actually, if you do more testing, your positivity should actually go down the more testing you do. So for it to even stay about flat suggests that there's increased transmission. So yes, we're seeing increased transmission. Some of it was predictable. Um, as we opened up more, we have you know, places at 25% capacity, 50% capacity, places that were completely closed, you know, personal services, all the kind of movings and going, going, goings on, uh, going from groups of 10 to groups of 50. Uh, of course, we can imagine that there's more opportunity for the virus to be spread, and in fact, that has been the case. And so we needed to have the opening and the um, increased ability to do more things. We needed that to be coupled with like 100% masking and distancing. And so I think our, our rates are probably high, but we really need like full 100% compliance to really try to keep our rates uh, where they were or keep them lowering. So we're in, you know, entreating, we're asking for the public to continue supporting us with that, uh, encourage people who aren't doing it, uh, why they should. Um, we need everybody to be on the same page for this. And if I may just add, sorry, to, to that. Um, I, I, Dr. ZK hits it, uh, the nail on the head as always. Um, you know, people need to wear their masks. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We need increasing masking, not decreasing. And we're never going to get to 100%, but that's our goal anyway. We want everybody to wear a mask, everybody who's medically able and, and old enough to be able to keep a mask on. Um, but the other thing I'd point out is that, that as you open things up, what happens is some bar owners, for example, uh, go beyond the capacity limits that we've allowed. And that is when you really run into trouble because it's already difficult enough in bars. People are not masked. You're drinking. Um, guess what? Your, you know, your uh, uh, droplets are greater because you're drinking. Um, and people tend to be yelling or shouting or speaking louder than they normally do because there's music playing. And so there's greater risk. And that's why we've kept the capacity limits where they are. But when people don't abide by those, when bars don't abide by those, it really creates a problem. And that isn't the only place. I'm not just calling them out, but I just want to be clear that just opening up doesn't mean that we're going to have a problem. It's opening up and then having people not abide by the rules and understand that opening up means having a greater atten attention to wearing a mask. Yes. Yeah, the CDC started putting those metrics up, the probable cases. I, I lose track of dates in COVID world, but I think it's been, I think it's, it's been more than three or four weeks that they uh, were going to put up uh, probable cases. And so they're asking us to put forth the probable cases. Probable cases are people who were probable contacts of a confirmed case that then developed similar symptoms in the time frame that would suggest that, in fact, you know, this person had COVID, you lived with them, um, we didn't test you, but you had all the symptoms and, you know, you had this direct epidemiologic link, you probably had it too. So those are the probable cases. So if the lab wasn't done for that second individual, but all signs point to being this was COVID, then that's a probable case. And so the CDC has been asking us to put probable cases. We're trying to put that uh, to be with them. We don't have, you know, in the beginning when we didn't have all the testing, right, we know that there were many cases where we would say, yeah, don't even try to get a test. You know, this person had it. You probably have it. Just stand down. If you get sick, go to the hospital. But just stay sequestered, you know, stay isolated. So there's lots of probable cases that are not in our total. You are correct. Dr. Do you yeah, I'm sorry, but not in the totals from the past, right? right. And, and what's happening now is there are fewer and fewer people who just, sorry, Go ahead. there are fewer and fewer people who, who just have um, the, the, the symptoms who don't get tested, right? Everybody, now testing is widely available. 
It wasn't widely available before. It is now widely available and free in many locations. And so people who are contacted who say, I have some symptoms, right, they can get tested or they might just isolate and are being contacted by the local public health department. But we're more, the more and more people are getting tested on their own, just choosing to. It's around two to five percent, you know, basically in all of the viewing area, the collar counties. I don't know exactly how, who's viewing you, but all the collar counties and in Cook County, um, all those regions, and I mentioned it briefly in my remarks, uh, but somewhere between two and a half and five percent. Yeah. Can I ask about Before. Mm -hmm. It's never too late to learn you know, what the right thing to do is. Um, and so I'm very glad that the president did that. I think there are probably a lot of people who follow his every word and now understand that, um, you know, that, that this is the right thing for them to do. We want everybody safe. I don't care what their politics are. Everybody in Illinois, I want them to wear a mask. And if the president comes out in favor of wearing masks, which he seemed to yesterday, um, then I think that's a can only be a good thing. Yeah, and I'm sorry you had another piece of your question. Yeah, okay. On the unemployment, yeah. Uh, the unemployment uh, that you found fraud. Yeah. Uh, folks that might have gotten that debit card and said, "Oh, wow, wonderful," and mm -hmm. went and used it, might they have to repay? Um, again, right now, what I can tell you is, if you receive that debit card. First of all, don't activate it. If you did have to activate it, you should contact the IDES. And uh, you will be contacted at one point or another. Um, presumably, the federal authorities are identifying those people who aren't actual applicants who received that. And so the people will be in contact with them. And people need to know that they shouldn't be they shouldn't take encouragement from the idea that they got a debit card. And as you know, your debit card by itself uh, needs to be charged with, you know, there needs there need to be dollars in the account before you can actually use it anyway. So, so it appears, and I, I'm just giving you what my understanding is now, um, it appears that, that in past breaches, we've all heard about these mass breaches of, of systems of corporations, um, and then they warn you, you know, go get your credit report uh, and so on. Um, many people don't do that. Many people don't respond properly to that. So all of that information is being held by somebody, some hacker, right, who wants to use it at some point in the future and waits a long enough period of time until they can find the right thing to do without you paying a lot of attention. And so they hold on to the information, and this, apparently, this program the federal government set up was something that was attractive to those hackers. Um, and so that's the, the fraud is being engaged in by them with information that they obtained in some other capacity. And they, you know, it's not that they're breaching our systems, it's they're applying in the normal way that people apply to get these uh, programs and payments to them uh, using the names that they've gotten. Now, how they would obtain them from somebody's mailbox if it were sent to somebody, I'm not sure. Um, and so, again, this is a... Uh, uh, there's a lot of federal investigation going on, and um, I'm hopeful that they'll get to the bottom out of it as soon as possible. But we wanted to warn everybody. Yeah. Do we have thousands of people in Illinois? Do we even have any idea on numbers? We don't know yet, but we know it's it's wide enough spread that you know we've gotten a lot of reports of it. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.